Today on Blue 58, Packers training camp is winding down, but position battles are still going strong as we enter the final days of the preseason. How do the Packers sort out the bottom of the roster? Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I am your host, John Meerdink, and I am happy to be with you here for another episode. Packers making roster moves after their second preseason game. Tyler Davis is headed to injured reserve. Jake Hansen is headed out of town. And in their place come two new players for the final few days of training camp here. The first is Marvin Pierre, a six foot two, 222-pound linebacker out of Kent State. A fine athlete, 9.08 relative athletic score, 457, 40-yard dash. Great in the jumping numbers, 40 and a half inch vertical, 11 foot and change broad jump. A good athlete, suffice it to say. Chances of making the roster, pretty slim. He's got like three practices and a preseason game to go. Stranger things have happened. It's probably not looking good for the 53-man roster, but there are 16 practice squad spots available. Call it an extended tryout. Interesting fact for Mr. Pierre here, the Packers are the sixth football team for which Mr. Pierre has played since 2018. He redshirted back in 2018 at Fort Scott Community College, then played one season at Butler Community College the next year before moving on to Murray State and then to Kent State. Then he signed with the Cardinals after the 2023 undra- or under- after the 2023 draft as an undrafted free agent. Now he is with the Packers just a shout out to all the grinders out there like Marvin Pierre, just trying to find an opportunity, and all it takes is one. Maybe it's the Packers for Marvin Pierre. Other guy coming to town is Elijah Hamilton, a guy who's kicked around the NFL and the USFL a little bit already. 6'2", 206 pound cornerback, 877 relative athletic score, mostly because of his jumping numbers and size. Not a burner. 464 in the 40 yard dash, but a 38 inch vertical and a 10 7 broad jump to go with his six foot two frame frame as a cornerback. Played his college football at Louisiana Tech and Vanderbilt, finishing out at Louisiana Tech after a couple of years at Vanderbilt. 53 college games over his career. Spent a little bit of time with the Miami Dolphins, as well as the St. Louis Battle Hawks in the XFL. Another practice body, another extended tryout sort of guy. Interesting fact about him, his dad played with the Packers in 1994 for about half of the season. He was active for five games. The Packers went three and two in those five games, including a 40 to three blowout over the Bears. Sorting through the play-by-play data available on Pro Football Reference, I could only find one play where his father, Ruffin Pierre or Ruffin uh, Hamilton was mentioned. Uh, and unfortunately, it's a penalty. He was penalized for an illegal crackback block during a punt return. A bit of a bummer, but that's more plays than I appear in in the pro football reference play-by-play data. We are kind of burying the lead, though, here because we got a really encouraging story coming out of training camp this week. Rashawn Gary is back and ready for 11-on-11 football, participating in 11-on-11 drills for the Packers. I have to think this is way ahead of schedule. Uh, just uh, not surprising, I guess, considering how Rashawn Gary has handled every other part of his career to this point. But still, getting back into 11-on-11 drills before the start of the regular season is a big win for him and a big win for the Packers. It affects so many different things, as we've talked about before. It's obviously great to have him back, and he starts to get to focus on things like you know that next contract that's coming up. Uh, it helps it helps Preston Smith out. It helps Kingsley and Igbari out. It helps Lucas Van Ness out. Everybody is better because Rashawn Gary is on the field. And that's just talking about the edge rusher room. There are so many other things that it does for the Packers defense that I think should be obvious enough that we really don't have to explain it. But he helps the Packers defense overall in many, many different ways. So huge news there. I have to imagine this puts him at least in the conversation for playing in week one. I don't want to say it's likely or a sure thing, anything like that, because things can change. And if the Packers want to go conservative and not have him, you know, playing on the road in week one, understandable. Uh, But it has to at least be on the table if he's playing in 11 on 11 stuff a week and a half out from the start of the season. It seems like things are pointed in the right direction for Rashawn Gary, as has basically been the case for most of training camp. Great work, great to hear, and I wish that was the case for our other injury news coming out of training camp, but unfortunately it is not. Eric Stokes, it looks like he's going to be on 
the physically unable to perform list for a while. Uh, Matt LaFleur giving an update on his progress today, and the update, unfortunately, is that there is really no progress. And to refresh your memory a little bit, he's actually dealing with two injuries, a foot and a knee injury that are both in the recovery process. People I've spoken to who have been at training camp, just casual observations say he still appears to be walking with a noticeable limp. Take that for whatever it's worth. I've also seen video of him that looks like he's moving just fine. So maybe it just depends on the day or how you're looking at him. But in any case, it doesn't sound like it's great news for Eric Stokes. I would expect he starts the season on the physically unable to perform list, which is a blessing in a way because it gives him time four weeks before they've got to start making a decision about him, or I guess four weeks before the window can even open where they start to make a decision about him. That gives them some roster flexibility, and they've got the guys around, I think, to weather that in the short term because it's probably going to be a while before he is up to speed and ready to go uh, for actual playing time. Uh, Considering just looking at where Rashawn Gary has been, it's been a couple of weeks since he came off the physically unable to perform list before he was able to jump into 11-on-11 stuff. If you do that same sort of thing with Eric Stokes, say he comes out or comes off the physical and able to perform list after those four weeks of the regular season and needs at least two weeks to ramp up before he's ready to go 11 on 11. Then you start talking about probably after the bye week again, like we we laid out initially. It it seems like it's going to be a while for Eric Stokes is, is all I'm saying here. And that's really unfortunate because he's heading into a crucial season. We got to start talking about picking up his fifth year option after this season. And right now the answer is a pretty quick and easy no. Unfortunately, hopefully he makes that a conversation that the Packers have to have down the stretch here. But looking ahead, just reading the tea leaves, one promising rookie season, a tough start to year number two, and then a really bad injury that's going to push into his third year. He would have to be exceptionally good in the second half of this season, just assuming that the first half is going to be basically a loss to get me to a point where I'd be comfortable saying, if I'm the GM, I want to pick up his fifth year option. It just looks like it's probably not in the cards for him right now, but that's the cart way ahead of the horse. A long way to go. Maybe he does end up having an outstanding second half to the 2023 season. A couple notes on preseason game number two. We've got to talk about Jordan Love because that's where every conversation about the Packers is going to start and probably end for the Packers this season and for the foreseeable future. But I, overall, I think very encouraging. The snap miscommunication with Josh Myers being, I think, exceptionally generous to Josh Myers there was obviously bad. There are two parties potentially at fault there. Myers apparently snapped it because he thought he saw somebody in the neutral zone. I thought even on the like full-speed broadcast angle of that, it looked pretty clear that there was not somebody in the neutral zone, and the Packers end up turning the ball over as a result. But the touchdown drive was excellent. Obviously, the bomb to Romeo Dobbs is awesome. Great play there by Dobbs. That's the sort of contested catch that I think we saw him have a little bit of trouble with last year. And uh, just as an aside, it looks like Dobbs has been stronger at the catch point this year than he was last year, which I think is one of the strongest or was one of the strongest knocks against him last year. He just didn't finish a lot of catches when he had to have his hands away from his body. He did not appear to have very strong hands last year. He seems to have improved that at least somewhat this year which is good to see. But anyway, that is a a great and encouraging thing to see Love hit that that deep shot to Dobbs. Great stuff there. I thought the scramble was awesome. Uh, Stepping out of pressure, stepping away from pressure, reading the situation and getting down, trying to avoid a big hit. Awesome stuff. Unfortunately, he did get hit when he slid. But what happened after he got hit was encouraging in two ways. First, Jordan Love popped up and looked fired up about it. Like he wanted to have words with somebody about what had just happened on that play. That was cool to see. That was probably my favorite thing to see from all of preseason game number two, just the fire with which he reacted. It's not something we've seen a whole lot from Jordan Love in the past. To a fault, he has been a very reserved guy. There haven't been a lot of high highs or low lows with him, which is a good thing in a way. But it's also nice to see him get a little heated sometimes when things don't go his way. And getting cracked from behind when you slide is definitely something not going your way. It was also great to see everybody in an instant immediately respond and say, absolutely not. We are not going to stand for that. 
Elton Jenkins in came in looking like he was ready for blood, which apparently has been the theme for Elton Jenkins this entire training camp. Got kicked out of practice in Cincinnati. He's ready to start something, which is cool to see. That would encourage me a lot as a young quarterback, seeing all those guys, especially like an all pro like Elton Jenkins, ready to do battle for you. I know that's what it, what's expected of your teammates in those situations, but it was great to see that there was no hesitation from the teammates. They were ready to go as soon as it happened, and they didn't have to have Jordan Love getting in anybody's face. Finally, the pass a couple plays later to Jaden Reed for the touchdown, awesome, awesome stuff. Maybe the best throw I've seen from Jordan Love in his young Packers career. There may be others, maybe more precise stuff, but moving to his left, resetting his feet, putting the ball where he did so Jaden Reed could catch it and run while having the ball away from the defender trailing behind him and that it all ends with a touchdown, I don't know what else you need to see. If it's me, I feel good not playing him in the third preseason game, but it looks like the Packers are, are going to have um, have love out there for at least a little bit to start the game. Encouraging to see, let's put it that way. Great stuff from Love. It looks like he's headed in the right direction to start the season. Let's just not have anybody in the first unit on offense get hurt doing something stupid between now and the start of the season. At center, we said we were going to be looking at that heading into the second preseason game. Things seem to have stabilized. Things were kind of all over the place heading into that first preseason game. You had Josh Myers getting moved around, you know, for some days with the first team, some days with the second team. Jo- uh, Zach Thomas taking snaps at center. John Runyon randomly gets inserted at center in, in the first preseason game to the point that I had to stop and look who is number 76 playing center because I thought I had missed something. It couldn't be John Runyon. He doesn't play center. He's never been there before, but lo and behold, there he is. In week two of the preseason, nothing of the sort. Myers was the only one of the center contenders to get snaps at center against the Patriots. He took 17 snaps at center. The bulk of the rest were taken up by our recently departed Jake Hansen and Cole Schneider. Nobody, Zach Tom not playing center here in week two of the preseason. John Runyon staying where he belonged in week two of the preseason. In any case, whether Myers is the man for the job or not, he seems to have it for the time being. And if you can't have somebody you know, you're really excited about at a position, the next best thing is at least having something decided. We can always change our mind later, but for right now, the Packers seem like they just want to build for week one, say, this is what we're going to go with. We're going to have Myers at center, probably uh, Zach Tom at right tackle, and we'll figure the rest out from there. If we got to move people around in week two and beyond, we'll do that. But for right now, we're making the decision and we're sticking with it. More on the offensive line here in a second, but I want to jump over to defense for a couple points here about uh, preseason game number two before we do that. I said I was going to be keeping a close eye on the defensive line, specifically Colby Wooden and Carl Brooks in game two of the preseason. Wooden split his time pretty evenly between defensive tackle and left end, according to Pro Football Focus. And if nothing else, and I thought his performance looked fine to good, I think that's where you want him. You want him as a traditional defensive end or like a three-tech defensive tackle because I think you move him too far inside and he's going to get eaten up. And if you move him too far outside, he's probably too slow to make a difference on the edge. Keeping him as a probably even still slightly underside three-technique defensive tackle or on the end as a probably like a nickel pass rusher or something like that is where you're going to maximize Colby Wooden and it seems like he is well on his way this year. Carl Brooks, meanwhile, plays almost exclusively inside in Week 2. 37 snaps on defense, 25 of them at one of the two tackle spots. A little bit at end, not nearly as much as we saw from Colby Wooden. That, too, seems like a really good fit for him. He ended up with two pressures on 25 pass rushes, not too shabby. Not, like, outstanding, but for a rookie guy still finding his way at what is a new position for him. Pretty good stuff for comparison's sake. Lucas Van Ness, one pressure on 13 pass rushes in preseason game number two. Not too shabby there either. As far as safety goes, I was hoping we would come out of this game with at least some kind of idea of someone who is going to step up and take ownership of this position. Instead, I have no idea what to think here. And rather than talking about, you know, what 
could happen with one of the guys at safety. I just want to say again that I think this exact scenario is the strongest argument for putting Rasul Douglas at safety. Nobody else has stepped up. They've had plenty of time. Other than Jonathan Owens, everybody else has been here all offseason long. Tarverius Moore was here for OTAs and minicamp and all that. Anthony Johnson, same story. Rudy Ford has more time under his belt. He was here all last season for all those things and this year as well. As well as playing with the Packers for, what, 400-some snaps on defense last year, he has not stepped up and taken ownership of this available spot in the secondary. They need a firm answer here at some point soon. If that's the case, and it is, why not try somebody who, one, you haven't tried yet, and two, is at the very least a better football player, just in the broadest possible sense, than anybody else you've tried at safety to this point. Rasul Douglas is better at corner, by miles, than any of these other guys are at safety. Why not at least try something different? Joe Barry has not been good enough in Green Bay to just have us take his word for things. He's been, he hasn't earned the, the right to just not try anything new. We've talked about this at length with the defensive line. The entire strategy last year, despite getting gashed again and again and again in the run game, getting seeing Dean Lowry get moved one way and then the other, just because he's not big enough to do what they wanted him to do and hasn't been for two defensive coordinators now, the whole strategy was, well, we've tried nothing and we're all out of ideas. They didn't try anything. They didn't really try to do anything different than the same idea that they had at the start of training camp in July by the end of November. And I feel like we're running into that same thing again here at safety. Well, nobody's really stepping up, but what are you going to do? I don't know. Try something else. Try something, anything. And to that point, Joe Barry is flat out wrong. He says he's never seen Rasul Douglas at safety, poking a hole, somewhat jokingly in Rasul Douglas's statement that he's the, you know, he's the starting safety for the Green Bay Packers. Uh, Douglas did play there in training camp last year when Joe Barry was the defensive coordinator. Perhaps Joe Barry was joking when he said that he hasn't seen Douglas at safety. Perhaps he just wasn't paying attention last year. Possible, maybe even likely, especially given how the Packers started out the regular season on defense last year. But Douglas has done it before. And I would just like to see that maybe he can do it again. It behooves the Packers to at least try. Now, I want to give a, a shout out here to our Discord member, Janelle, for the point we're about to talk about here because she mentioned it during the game on Saturday. Uh, but Rashid Walker made the start at left tackle, which was a bit of a surprise. In fact, as I wrote in a piece at thepowersweep.com, it's the closest thing to a straight up surprise that I think I can really remember in the recent history of preseason games. Given how much the roster moves and how much they're just trying stuff, other than trying John Runyon at center out of the blue, Rashid Walker starting at safety is the biggest surprise I can really require, uh, recall for quite some time. Because presumably that's going to be Yash Nyman's job. To be the top tackle off the bench either on the left side or on the right side. But that wasn't the case against the New England Patriots. It's Rashid Walker getting the nod here. Now what could be happening here? A couple of things. First, the Packers could be just as Matt LaFleur says they are. They just felt good about Rashid Walker and wanted to get a look at him against the Patriots once. You probably have a pretty good idea what Yash Nyman can offer you. He started plenty of games in the past. He was a long-term starter at left tackle in 2021, and he played plenty of time there and on the right side in 2022. You know what you have in Yash Nyman. You probably don't know, at least not quite in the same way, with, with Rashid Walker. But it's also possible, I don't want to say likely or not, but it's also possible the Packers may have a roster move in mind for Yash Nyman. And given the quality of player that he has been in the past, I think it's unlikely that that plan would be to release him. It's possible that the Packers may be working on something where Yash Nyman could be traded. Nobody has said anything to this effect. This is just, you know, my brainwave, our Discord user Janelle 
uh, who posited this during the game. But if I was trying to protect an asset that I was trying to move, I might limit his exposure a little bit. And the Packers seem to have done that with Yash Nyman here in week two. It's possible also that he could just be nursing some kind of injury as well. That storyline isn't very exciting, so we're just going to pretend like that's not even really a possibility. And if it, in, in all honesty, we would probably know something if he actually was hurt. But I think it's at least possible that the Packers are getting ready to make a move here. Nothing, maybe short of Rasheed Walker starting at left tackle in the regular season, would really be a surprise. Finally, a couple questions before we let you go for this episode. First question comes from the Jet Sweep guy asking, uh, following on a couple of conversations we've had about the Packers' third running back, he asks, what is the league average for number of running backs kept on the 53? I'm wondering if the Packers' tendency to keep two running backs is normal, and is this a recent trend? I can't dig deep enough into the data to give you a firm answer on the league-wide trends here. I would imagine the Packers are a slight outlier, but I don't think it's as uncommon as it has been in the past. And to the second part of that question, I do think that is a more recent trend for a couple of reasons. First, it's cheaper to rent than to buy. And by that, I mean, it's a lot cheaper to stick a guy in the practice squad and play him practice squad money and then just elevate him as needed, paying him the comparable game checks at that point. And then once you get to the point where you can't elevate him from the practice squad anymore, You just replace him with another guy that you can elevate up and down from the practice squad and go from there because chances are, as we've outlined in the past, this is not going to be a guy who's playing just tons and tons of snaps for you anyway. This is going to be a pretty small cog in your overall machine. The second possibility here is that the Packers have just been so built around passing over the past few years that they haven't had a ton of reason to have a third guy around. They've had lots of resources at the top of the running back depth chart anyway, and those guys perhaps more important, more importantly, have just mostly been available. So you really haven't had a whole lot of need for a third running back anyway. But I do think it is a recent tendency, especially with the bigger practice squads league-wide. You have a lot more reason with 16 spots available to keep guys on the practice squad, elevate them as needed based on other availability, and then just go for there, go from there. Say you need Patrick Taylor to fill a spot on punt team because some of their you know, some linebacker or safety is banged up. You elevate them for a week and then you go from there. Or say either Aaron Jones or A.J. Dillon is a bit banged up, maybe not to the point that they can't go in the game, but you bring up the third guy that you're comfortable with just as sort of an insurance policy. Normally you would give all of the the snaps to either Jones or Dillon, but just because one of them is a little bit under the weather for whatever reason, you want a third guy there, you've got one. And it is cheaper to just keep the guy in the practice squad than be paying him week in and week out whether he's active or not. So pretty recent trend. Can't speak to the the overall league-wide trends on this. I know there are some teams that go the entire opposite direction. The New York Jets are probably going to be one of them this year. It seems like they've got about 40 running backs that they like. But yeah, I, I do think this is the sort of thing we're going to be seeing more and more. If you've got two guys that you like that you want to give most of the touches to, there's really no reason to keep that third guy around. Just spend the other roster spot on a you know linebacker depth or safety depth or depth at some other spot. It's it's all about roster manipulation, and that's one way you can kind of steal a roster spot a little bit, especially if you're going to be doing what the Packers are doing or have done in the past with like a Caleb Jones or a Jonathan Ford, which is basically going to redshirt him, but you want him to stay on your 53-man roster. Well, Not having a third running back is a great way to free up one more spot where you can do something like that. Speaking of those kind of decisions, keeping a third running back versus depth somewhere else, old Packers fan asked something basically to that effect. Now, it was a very long and and well thought out question. I don't want to read the entire thing out, but basically it boils down to this. Roster construction involves decisions like Do you keep a third or fourth running back versus another fullback versus maybe a sixth, seventh, or eighth wide receiver or a tenth lineman or a sixth defensive lineman or a sixth outside linebacker, so on and so forth? How do you rank those positions heading into cutdown day? I think that's that's a really important thing to think about as you're trying to get a sense for what the Packers are doing in sort of roster building terms. Broadly speaking, this is what I would do. This is how I would sort out those positions. And I think this is more or less in line with what the Packers would do as well. 
your first tier there is your outside linebackers, your edge rushers, and your offensive linemen with a bit of an asterisk. If you're going edge rushers versus offensive tackles, I think it's basically dead even. If you're talking about the bottom of your offensive line or your bottom of your edge rusher depth chart versus your tackles, that's really close. Because, I, and I think as we've seen with the Packers over the past couple of years, they put a premium on getting those developmental guys in the pipeline. Yash Nyman, Luke Tenuta, Caleb Jones, Rashid Walker, Kadeem Telfort. That's five guys. Telfort, you know, the, the weakest addition to that group to, to try to prove that point. But the Packers have tried and tried hard to keep those developmental guys around at tackle just so you've got tackle depth because those are the most important offensive linemen. Edge rusher is crucially important too. And in a normal year, I think the Packers would be more willing to keep maybe a sixth edge like a Brenton Cox or somebody like that than they probably are this year just because their top five are so rock solid. Rashawn Gary, Preston Smith, J.J. Anigbari, Lucas Van Ness, and Justin Hollins. Hollins is the closest thing to vulnerable there. And even so, he was good for the Packers last year. That's your fifth guy. That's the conversation you're having. Do we keep a guy that was good last year in hopes of having more team control or for a longer time for a guy who's maybe almost as good? Good problem to have. If you're talking about edge rushers versus guards, I think that is a different conversation. But that too is tough in Green Bay this year because the guard depth doesn't really seem to be there. So they're probably going to end up keeping a guy like a uh, like a Royce Newman just because they've got no other options, really. You don't have just tons and tons of te- depth at guard and center. I mean, Jake Hansen gets released today, but Hansen was a guy they put a lot of time into at center. And it's really only because they've got that tackle depth and could probably jump, uh, bump Zach Tom over to center if they really needed to, that they can make a move like that because otherwise you don't really have a choice other than to keep Hansen just because he's the, the only guy with extended center experience unless you're really talking about moving Elton Jenkins again. It gets complicated, but I think if it comes down to edges versus guards, you're probably giving the the, the edge to the edges there. The next tier to me is cornerback. If you're looking to, to stash some more roster guys, I think you go here because that's the most valuable spot in your secondary. Safety comes next because I think they have the most special teams value of any group on this list. You can also get a lot of nickel corner snaps out of your safety group if you've got the right guy there. Most corners seem to be, or most you know, nickel corners seem to be safeties in all but name anyway. They're guys with strong safety skill sets. They're guys that should be able to to play that role really well. You know, looking back to 2015, that was the whole thinking behind Demarius Randall. He ended up playing on the outside more than I think was the really the plan, but he had those sort of nickel corner slash safety sort of skills. He was good enough in coverage that he could get away with being an outside corner, something that he did at one point actually say was his natural position anyway. Just want to reignite that eight-year-old debate here. This is a good use of our time. Anyway, um, safety has that sort of hybrid versatility, but it's not it's not as valuable as having a good corner. So it falls down the list a little bit more. Then at the very bottom here, you've got your far deep wide receiver depth guys and your running backs and your fullbacks. The the sixth, seventh, eighth wide receivers on your depth chart, you got to remember these are guys that are getting basically no reps on offense. You're talking about Juwan Winfrey type numbers, where if you break 100 over the course of the season, you're doing really, really well for yourself, which is not saying all that much considering how many guys have to take snaps at receiver over the course of the year. The Packers just aren't using receivers on special teams the way that they did in the past, so some of the value there has been diminished, but it still has more value than I think a third string running back or even a second or maybe even a first fullback. You can find these guys the easiest. The Packers have needed fullback type players in the past, and they just basically create them out of thin air. You you get a John Lovett. You get a Dominique Daphne. You find some sort of, you know, low budget Josiah Deguara, or maybe even you overspend at the position and just get yourself a normal budget Josiah Deguara. These guys have the littlest external utility out of their primary position. Uh, guys like third string running backs, even if they do have special teams value, what is the special teams value of a guy like Patrick Taylor? That has come up a lot this preseason, but we're talking about like a hundred special team snaps at most. He's a part-time player, even on special teams. It's not playing just a whole ton. 
you want to talk about a core special teamer, I mean, Dallin Levitt, over 300 special team snaps. Tyler Davis last year, over 300 special team snaps. Those are core special teamers. A guy who's playing 100 snaps, that's nice, but it's six-ish per game, maybe less now in a uh, 17-game season. It's just not a whole lot of contribution there. Still valuable, but just not tons and tons. So if you're looking at the sort of positions the Packers really have to make there, that's, I think, a good rubric there your outside linebackers and your tackles, other offensive linemen, corners, safeties, receiver depth, running backs, fullbacks. That's your value there. So if you're looking at the roster bubble guys, probably stack their roster spots accordingly, kind of looking at that as a guide. That's all I've got for you in this episode of Blue 58. I appreciate you tuning in. I would appreciate it even more if you would take a second and share this episode with someone you think would enjoy it. That really is the thing that helps us grow the most. Your word of mouth is what gets people to listen and gets more people involved in this conversation you and I are having about the Green Bay Packers, which in turn is going to help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.